So Debbie, we talk a lot. We do. <laughs> we don't get to talk in person very often. We don't, and I've never heard her give a talk before, and that was outstanding. Wow, thank you. Well, you, I was like, look at Debbie just freestyling, and I'm gonna stand up there and read. So we are both independent scholars. Yes. Yes. We are both unpopular in certain circles. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but we are both committed to making sure that the kids in our communities have the mirror books that they deserve and that all children are getting accurate representations, culturally specific representations. I would love it if you could share with the audience your thoughts on Sherman Alexie's picture book, Thunder Boy. Okay. <laughs> All right, it's not tribally specific. And that's one of my four concepts that I said is very important. We don't know the nation that this child is from in that book. We don't know the nation that his parents are from. We know that, or some of us know that, if you happen to be in one of the um, schools where Sherman Alexie is touring and talking about that book. And he is saying in those spaces that the child is of his own nations, um, which is Spokane. So he is saying it in the talks he's giving, but it's not in the book. And I think that's a huge problem because it becomes a generic, any kind of Indian, it doesn't matter kind of story, which is precisely what we're pushing against as teachers and people who are interested in expanding what people know about Native people. So I think that's a real problem. Um, I do hope they put a, an author's note or a, an ed editor's note, some kind of a note in the back of the book that will help people know a little bit more about that. And, to that end, I have a page on my website that talks about that, a little bit about native naming in particular, because it varies by tribe. It's not the same across tribes. Um, I, I said there's over 500 um, federally recognized nations, and there, amongst that, you know, when we talk about diversity and the conversations we're all having right now about diversity, um, we're thinking about, about race and culture and ethnicity, but if you start talking about native nations, you, it just explodes because of the language differences amongst all those nations and the religious differences and, and all that. So, so that book is a problem. I know it won a big award yesterday. I think it will probably be in the running for additional big, big awards. I want librarians to, I don't want to say don't buy it because um, I do like the story, but I read that story as a person firmly grounded in who I am as a, as a person who grew up on my reservation. And I know my, my sister's um, grandkids are going to love that story because it is funny. And th their dad is a big guy, just like, just like this, the character in there. Um, so the, the reader really makes a difference, and what the reader brings to the story really makes a difference. But right now, we're talking about a very ignorant society, and until we get to a society where there's more general knowledge, we do need author's notes. So I wondered if, do you put author notes in your books? So certainly for the lynching book, I, I definitely had an afterword and pointed people to further resources uh, and tried to give some historical context. I think it's so interesting because, I mean, we were talking a little bit about specificity, and I cringe too when I see a book that's set in Africa. It's like, really, which, you know, can we be a bit more specific? Or a book that's set in the Caribbean and there's a lack of specificity. But then there is this part of me that feels like the more in depth we go and the more detail we provide, the more we give them to appropriate. And I wonder if you could talk about the dominant culture and the way it reads difference and specifics and details. Like essentially, when I was reading your blog about, your, one of your blog posts about Thunder Boy, um, you were concerned about teachers reading this book and then saying, everybody pick your own name. Right, I, that, that, that's a huge concern <laughs> for me because what, um, in the recent news cycle, one of the new, recent news cycles when Donald Trump was going after Elizabeth Warren and uh, the, one of the memes that emerged on Twitter was he started calling her um, Pocahontas and people said he was ignorant, let's make a name for him. And so there was like, what's Trump's Indian name kind of thing going on? Um, which is just poking fun and mocking really significant pieces of who we are as Native people. So um, there are things that I don't share, things that, that we, the details of what goes on in the Kiva, the way that I got my name. I'm not going to share that because such knowledge has been appropriated and mocked and made use of in ways that denigrate what it means to me. And I think that that's a, 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 a real concern to um, Native people who are trying to protect their children from being the subject of mockery. There's a, I, I have a, I've been talking increasingly about adding another piece to Rudine's um, sliding glass doors mm -hmm. and mirrors. 
And that's curtains. Every people everywhere ah. has a curtain that they draw on certain things that they do because that's not everybody's business. And so we have curtains. And the way I came upon that was actually trying to develop that, use that, uh, her metaphor for a talk I was going to give in Hawaii last year and thinking about um, a window for, um, for, for someone to use to, to learn about Native people. And, and, I, and I Googled <laughs> windows and Kiva and Pueblo Indians and, and it brought our Kiva up and, and uh, one of our ceremonial structures and it had a curtain on it. And I said, duh, uh, <laughs> right? There's certain things that we do not share and here's the perfect way for me to bring that idea into the, into the conversation. That's so interesting. Can we talk about men? For a minute? Sure. <laughs> I wonder, do you think that Sherman Alexi in some ways gets a pass from some people because he's a man? Sherman Alexi has that dimension to his character, to his personality, that people just adore. You know, he has he has fans. <laughs> I, that's, I don't need to say anymore. You know what I mean. He has a lot of fans. He plays well to a white audience. Um, and uh, there's this, there, among a lot of women in the country, there is this kind of a swooning around men that doesn't happen around women. And I think that means that their books sell in ways that women's books don't sell, uh, that uh, alluded to that. And I think that's very true. Now, I was really disappointed in Sherman, and, and uh, I've had dinner with him more than once. I haven't talked to him about this book. But I was very disappointed that I was hearing him speak at various functions with this book and saying that no one else is doing this kind of writing. And I think, what about Louise Erdrich? What about Cynthia Lydic Smith? What are you telling us about the women who are doing this work? Um, I think it's a huge problem. Yeah, I have to say I've, I've heard enough anecdotes from other black women writers. Like I said, I don't get invited to a lot of places, but they've been at ALA and other conferences and said they've been trampled by white women librarians trying to get next to the one straight male of color in the room. And I have witnessed that fangirling in person, and it's not cute. It's really not. And as a feminist, you know, I always, I'm always, you know, Debbie Downer. Not yeah, sure. Whoa, your name <laughs> for real. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> how do we start a conversation that says um, sisterhood matters, or does it matter in the children's literature community in a community dominated by women? How do we even have that conversation? I find it particularly difficult for me as a black woman because I want there to be more black male authors. I want there to be black men going into schools talking about the books that they write. And what we see right now is that the majority of illustrators are black men, the majority of writers are black women. So then I have black women friends who are illustrators and I'm always trying to promote them and, and I work with women illustrators as often as I can. Um, but it, it becomes very difficult to say anything because the black male in our society is viewed as endangered, and they are, but black boys and black men are valued more highly than black girls and women who are also endangered. So how do we say not just black lives matter, but all black lives matter, and then include trans people in that and queer people in that? And I feel like I need, I have an intersectional approach and, and maybe a lot of other people don't. How do we address that? That intersectional conversation is really taking off, I think, in recent years. Um, it's not new, but it is um, more visible than it has been in the past. And, and it's a big one for us, too, because uh, as, the, as the photographs that I showed you of Native people, it isn't what you look like that defines you as a Native person. But we do have a lot of people who have that mixed parentage and claim that Native identity and um, do harm to Native nations because they don't know what it means to make that claim. Um, they had a lot of people are taking those DNA tests and having, uh, finding out that they've got some native heritage and so there they are, native, and they can say that, um, not knowing that actually the tribes don't recognize the DNA test as a way of saying you're a member of this nation because the tests aren't that specific. Um, so intersection, intersectionality is something very important. In Cynthia Lytic Smith's books, she is bringing in black Indians into her stories. The picture book, Jingle Dancer, the lawyer character in that book, that was a sticking point for her to actually sell that manuscript. People that she was shopping Jingle Dancer to thought, well, you have a l lawyer in there, Indian lawyer, really? You know, you, people didn't know that we are lawyers, <laughs> uh, or in doctors, or doctors, Indians have to be dancers and drummers and artists, and that's it. Um, 
But your daughter just graduated from Harvard Law School. <laughs> oh, Liz. She did. And so Jingle Dancer was actually a very special book for me because I wish I had that book when my daughter first danced because it was about getting ready to dance. And um, anyway, there's a, there's one of the characters is a, is a lawyer in that book. She's, and so that, that book works for my daughter now as a young child who is going to be dancing for the first time and as a lawyer who is going to be um, practicing law. Um, so inter that's a really big growing area and we need more information out there about that and that's what librarians are about you know you're about sharing information and providing good information to people so that when you have those conversations about intersectionality that they are ones that further what we know about all the peoples involved in um, what we call we the people of the of this country can I make one concluding remark I just want to say thank you to you Debbie because it is very easy for me to talk about my own oppression, but I read an article recently that was called, titled, uh, Stolen Lives on Stolen Land, and What Do African Americans Owe Indigenous People? And I feel like my community, and I personally have a whole lot of work to do, uh, and I realized even as I was giving my talk that I, I haven't made distinctions when I say kids of color and I should be adding First Nations children. Um, so I have work to do, but you teach us so much, and I just want to thank you for that. Thank you, Zeta. <laughs> so, do we want to do Q and A, or do we want to just? I don't want to get too far behind on our schedule. We might have time for like one question. <laughs> Should we do be that, or what do you think? Well, All right. Does this work? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no pressure, but it's just one, so. <laughs> Hi, I'm a children's librarian, and I also have a legal background. And Debbie, I was really, um, your talk really made me think to, to define Native people as members, uh, citizens of their nation. And then what it started making me think is what what do you do about all the native peoples who aren't in federally recognized tribes, who don't have a who don't have a recognized nation, but they're a native person? That that is a big conversation happening too. There are the federally recognized tribes. There are some state recognized tribes that are trying to get federally recognized, and there's a lot of fake tribes out there. So we have it's a very difficult conversation to have because there are. Uh, um, the, the tendency is to say, well, forget federal recognition because that's the government that oppressed you in the first place. And, and so why would you want to be using federal recognition as your starting point? Um, and I think that we have to start somewhere. And we start with that bit of information and then we spiral on out. Now, there are people that are not tribally enrolled in um, federally recognized nations. There are people that are disenrolled from federally recognized nations, but it's a very political thing. I think that's a big takeaway, is that we don't walk on water. You know, Native people are seen as like, wow, mystical, wonderful, wisdom-filled people, but we are political beings just like anybody else. And so the resources, the, the, the stories that you're hearing about people getting disenrolled from a nation are happening because of the resources that are there. And human beings being human beings, they will fight for those resources and you're ending up saying, well, these people aren't enough Indian, so they are going to be disenrolled. That doesn't address your question about what to do about that. Um, I think there's a lot of thinking to do about that. And um, in terms of what I can offer to all of librarians when you want something practical on the ground to use right now, I think we start with the historical context, which means we were here first. We're not first Americans. And the, and the writings that I'm seeing about us being first Americans, that's really wrong because we weren't Americans thousands of years ago. We were our native nations. And calling us first <coughs> Americans undoes that existence as a people that was here before Europeans. Um, so that's our starting place. And, it's, and it will spiral out and there, and there are ongoing conversations and much to learn about that. Um, I don't have anything more to offer than that, and I, and I wish that I did, and I think we'll get there sometime. But we have to start somewhere. That's where I start. You're not happy with that answer. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
there's some recognition, but it's like a partial recognition. I don't know. I don't know the law. But it does seem like um, it does seem like a distinction from the dominant culture that's saying they're not. If you're, if that's the like, it triggered a response of an emotional response in me. So I want to understand your place of starting there on an emotional level. Well, part part of what. Our ancestors fought like hell to preserve what we had. And for, for us to say we're going to step away from federal recognition and um, let go of that, we are undoing a whole lot. And I think the risks are far too great to our existence if, we, if anybody moves away from that, in any of the nations. And so we're not seeing that happen. I think nations are trying to figure out how to accommodate the others that are not part of their nations yet, um, but there, there, there's over 500, there's, and they're all different. Some of them, some of them are the, the Wampanoag, for example. You have to actually live there and be participating in the community. The Cherokees don't have that part as part of their of their um, uh, citizenship requirements. I wish I had more to offer. And I so, want you to fangirl. I want you to fangirl Zeta because <laughs> because I think she does great books. But you know, don't fangirl Anne Rinaldi because <laughs> seriously because a lot of writers pump out a lot of white writers pump out a lot of books about a wide range of people that they really don't know much about and. Um, she might have some books that are excellent, but the ones that she's done about Native people are not excellent. And so when you fangirl her and get all of her books because you like her, you are doing a disservice to your uh, patrons by providing them with materials that are not recommendable. And then when that author gets critiqued, the fangirls come for you. Yes, they do. <laughs> Sometimes. Not you, personally. <laughs> I don't know that, but yeah. Okay. My okay, laugh got on the mic. Thank you, Zeta and Debbie, so much. <laughs> <laughs>